the scribes and the Pharisees were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Please be seated. This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. What gall! <laughs> Many of you may know that uh, together with our friend Carolyn Owens, who regretfully uh, knew for Reasons of being down with the flu can't be with us today. Uh, had been visiting the Santa Rita jail. Um, Carolyn actually had been doing it for quite a while before I was, and then I joined in this ministry back in the fall. And over time, hopefully, uh, we'll invite any other of you who feel called to that ministry to join in. In fact, we are joined by a guest. Uh, this is Chaplain Richard Benoit over here on this side, and he is with. Uh, Alameda County Detention Ministries, and we will be hearing more about this ministry from him later. But one thing that strikes me every time I go into the jail is I'm having a multitude of thoughts and feelings. It's like a vortex, sort of a, a crucible uh, of both the psychological and the spiritual things that go into this complex and multifaceted thing that we know as the human condition. But there's one thought I notice I never have, and that is, gosh, these people are lucky. They, they must have had so much fun doing whatever it was that got them locked up in here. I, I never find myself thinking that. <laughs> now we laugh, but think about the gospel we just heard. It's a very familiar one, the parable of the prodigal son. People who know very little about the Bible have probably at least heard this one before. Chances are Jesus told it more than once to merit it being recorded in such lengthy detail in Luke's Gospel. Where in this parable did the older son's logic run afoul? Did he begin to part company with reality? I think there's more than one good answer to that question, but the place that really catches me is the place where he makes the mistaken assumption, or it's an implicit assumption at least, that his younger brother was off having a grand old time in the other country, much more fun than the older one was having back home with the father, and that somehow he needs to be punished for this. But let's read the story for what it actually says. Maybe momentarily, for the first few days, first few weeks, however long it took, the younger son really was having a rollicking good time. There was a component of pleasure there, for sure. But boy, was it fleeting. It didn't take long for the other shoe to drop, for him to run out of money, for a famine to hit the country, and for him to realize he was in serious trouble. And because he had severed the connection with his father, the option of that as his safety net, as his comfort, was gone. So finally he comes to himself and he comes back home. And the older brother's thinking is, why are we throwing a party for this guy? This guy's already had enough of a party. What about me? I've been being obedient all this time and slaving along. Don't you see the fallacy in that logic? Which one of the two of them actually had it better? Was it not the older one? And the father, you know, not in a... Uh, punitive sort of way, sort of points that out to him. He says, you know, you have always been with me. All that I have is yours. You have had that connection to me. You have had the comfort and the safety of knowing that you belong to me, and you will continue to belong to me forever. You have had no wrong done to you. Now, perhaps your brother hasn't had any wrong done to him from the outside either. But, even though it was initially self-inflicted, he has suffered greatly. In other words, his disobedience has been its own punishment. Do we really need to punish him anymore? Or is it time to just throw a party 
and say, welcome home, thank God you figured it out. This, I think, is really the pattern in human life. It is so easy to encounter somebody who has made poor decisions, who has been disobedient, who has gone off the rails, and say, not only did you deserve everything you got as a natural consequence to that, but you also deserve the punishment of not being welcomed back into the fold when you come to your senses, when you start going to the 12-step meetings, when you start turning your life around and trying to walk the straight and narrow path again. You still need to be stigmatized and castigated for the poor decisions you made. Well, this parable just blows a complete hole in that logic. And I'm going to suggest that there's another assumption that underlies it, and this is the assumption that perhaps we really need to get at, which is, obedience is no fun. Obedience is drudgery. Obedience is boring. The good life, the fun stuff, is out there doing all the stuff that the younger son was doing. Yes. Yeah. 
marriage, I get to do all of those things. If I remember to switch that one word and then to prayerfully meditate on what a blessing each and every one of those things is, it changes me from the inside out. At first, I have to force it. There's no question about it. But every time I rehearse that pattern of thought, every time I offer up to God a prayer of gratitude for the very same thing that a moment ago I would have said, ugh, I have to do it, it begins to change me from the inside out. And all of a sudden, the obedience, rather than becoming a source of consternation, is a wellspring from which I get an amazing amount of joy and I would even say just raw, giddy pleasure. There's this story out there, and I think it pervades our society and perhaps even stigmatizes the church, that somehow great God is this great cosmic killjoy that doesn't want you to have any fun. And I'm here to say, and I think the parable of the prodigal son says it better than almost any other piece of scripture, that exactly the opposite is true. God is the universe's greatest hedonist and invites us into that hedonism. And it's the path of obedience, but more so gratitude, really focused daily, wild gratitude for that, for the opportunity to engage in that obedience that brings us into that life of divine hedonism. So I'm here to tell you, don't, like I said on Ash Wednesday, don't let the language of Lent fool you. It can sound really heavy, really cumbersome, really dark at points, but ultimately it invites you into a level of joy and pleasure that will simply blow your mind. So take the lesson from the parable of the prodigal son. Be the older son, but with one exception.